This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So we looked at the finance function, and we've looked at IT, and Chapter 8 it deals with operations management, which 9 times out of 10 means manufacturing. Uh, the activities required to make and deliver products or to deliver services. Now, for a manufacturing organisation, these activities include the, the list which is shown here. Uh, procurement or purchasing, that's the raw materials, how we're going to, to get that. Uh, the receipt of the raw materials and what you do with them. Uh, warehousing, storing them. Uh, issuing them in a timely manner to the production line. Uh, so that people can efficiently make what they have to, to make. The actual manufacturing operations themselves, what happens to finished product, whether it's warehouse or whether it goes uh, directly out to the uh, purchaser. They'll be receiving orders uh, and they'll be dispatching goods. Uh, and, and how we're going to get these goods to the, the customer. And again, there's this choice. In some organizations, the customer comes to you to get the goods. Some other organizations uh, uh, run their own transport facilities, uh, whereas many, of course, uh, subcontract that outsource that to a logistics company. Now, a very important uh, idea in uh, operations and management, and indeed the, the whole business of uh, an organization making profit, is a concept of the, the value chain. Uh, and this is something which was uh, uh, essentially invented by Professor Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School. Uh, and really, you need to know what is in the diagram of the value chain. And we'll spend uh, a reasonable amount of time just talking about it. Basically, what Michael Porter says is we're going to put onto this diagram the, uh, his grouping of the various activities which can take place in every organization really. So along the bottom uh, we have what are called the primary activities. Uh, these activities are a bit like, if you know what the, the, the phrase direct cost means, these are very closely associated with the actual almost manufacturing of a, an article. So we have inbound logistics and inbound logistics is the receipt of raw material. Uh, it is not the ordering of raw material, it is a receipt of raw material. And we'll come back to all of these in a moment. Uh, and then uh, you have the operations, which is basically produc production. You have the outbound logistics, how you're going to get the finished goods to your customers. Uh, there is uh, marketing and sales, how you're going to find your customers, how you're going to tell your customers that you exist and these are your products. The service, and service is anything which takes place after the main event of sales. Service could be training, uh, training your, your customers on how to use the product. Service could be the installation of the product. It could be the maintenance of the product. It could be supplying consumables for the product. And indeed, a lot of money can be made out of this service element. Going across the top of the, uh, the diagram, uh, we have what uh, he called the support or secondary activities. And to some extent, these are a bit like kind of fixed costs, fixed overheads. Uh, they're kind of going to be carried on irrespective, really, of the, uh, the, the, the volume being manufactured at any particular uh, time. Don't want that. So the um, uh, elements uh, which uh, we have here, uh, he talked about the firm infrastructure, which is a bit like the head office. Uh, it's how we're going to organize your accounting department and some of the admin departments and so on. And of course, the accounting department can be uh, affecting inbound logistics operations, outbound logistics and so on. That's why they're written across the top here. Technology development is basically research and development, improving processes, improving manufacturing processes, and indeed uh, improving the products themselves. Human resource management, the recruitment, training, appraisal, retention, and so on uh, of your staff. And finally, there is procurement, uh, which uh, rather curiously, perhaps, uh, Porter 
uh, splits out from inbound logistics, procurement is really the act of placing orders, finding suppliers, placing orders, not just for raw materials, but also for non-current assets, uh, your, your lap laptops and so on as well. Now, what Porter was saying here is we can map onto this diagram every activity uh, which an organization uh, will undertake. Uh, and the curious thing is that an organization undertakes these activities uh, and and at the end of all of this, it, it produces a profit. Uh, and Porter said, you really have to understand how come you can make a profit. So let's say that all of these activities, let's say that their cost uh, was say five million. Uh, and let's say that the revenue that you get from selling your products is seven million. Uh, and Porter said uh, that uh, there's always a magic trick going on there. You spend five million and people give you seven million. What, what's going on in, in there? Why, for example, don't they, they, they undertake these activities themselves uh, and save two million? And he said the, the reason they don't do it themselves is either they can't do it themselves or they can't do it as efficiently themselves. Now, let me just get rid of this. Uh, uh, they can't do it as efficiently uh, themselves or they don't want to do it themselves or it's very risky for them to do it themselves. So, so uh, when you're doing this for your customers, you must be doing something that they value. Uh, you are maybe bringing expertise to it. You're bringing maybe efficiency to it. You are uh, taking the risk off their shoulders or something of that, that type. But it says you must understand what it is, which in a way gives you the right uh, to make the two million profit or margin, which is there. And you must be careful uh, that whatever way you try to improve your operations, that you do not disturb or affect what your customers really value. So, for example, uh, many UK banks, uh, they moved away from having you know a bank in every kind of high street. Uh, they, meant they moved to internet banking, but also they moved to online, to, to, to telephone banking. And then they thought, well, it's going to be much cheaper if I have my core centers abroad. Uh, and effectively, what they were doing was changing the way some of the operations were, were being handled in their banking. And they moved their, their call centers uh, abroad. Uh, but actually, they found that many users, many customers, perhaps older users, found that quite difficult. Uh, because even though their, their staff abroad were very well trained, there, there was often a, a bit of an accent. And older people with, with uh, not maybe quite such good hearing found it very difficult maybe to, to pick up what these people were saying. Uh, and people began to move away from banks uh, because they had uh, overseas call centers, which they found quite difficult to, to, to actually deal with. Uh, or maybe uh, what uh, you know, we, we, we've had a lot of changes in airlines. So airlines uh, began to not give you food, not give you free refreshments on board. You had to kind of begin paying for that. They began charging for um, baggage and seat allocation and so on there. And there was a little bit of movement within uh, you know, airlines, uh, customers. Uh, if an airline treated you too harshly by maybe cutting down some of the comfort, for example, and some of the, the or really the kind of proper behavior towards passengers, people would move away. Uh, so you have to be careful. It's all very well looking for cost savings and greater efficiencies, uh, but you must ensure that at the end of the day, you deliver value to the customer. You deliver what the customer wants. Uh, otherwise, in most industries, the customer will be able to go somewhere else. You need to understand uh, what these nine elements are inbound logistics operations, outbound logistics, sales and marketing and service, and then the secondary activities of firm infrastructure, technology development, human resources uh, management, 
and uh, finally the procurement. You need to know what those are. So this was one way of, of uh, setting out uh, maybe the various operations that have to be managed within an organization. Now, uh, other, other people, other uh, people have uh, different uh, kind of views of what maybe happens within organizations and different, different kind of uh, pictures, if you, if you like, uh, here. Uh, so here we have uh, it, uh, another diagram, really, which is maybe rather better at seeing there's a kind of chain going on here, that organizations is not just themselves, uh, but like any open system, uh, you rely on goods and services coming in, uh, and then you rely in a way on sending those out to, to customers or to distributors and, and so on. And this diagram kind of puts various links of that chain together. I think maybe we are in the middle uh, here. Uh, this is us. Uh, and what we uh, essentially uh, liaise with is our suppliers. So the sales department of our suppliers is liaising really with the procurement uh, department of ourselves. Uh, some writers say, well, that doesn't make much sense actually to split procurement and inbound logistics. These are all bound up together. The best way uh, to obtain goods can't really be separated from uh, where you place the orders and physically how you get those goods. And I could just go back to up, up here a moment. There's, of course, a, a lot of choice in all of this. Inbound logistics. Uh, we'll see inbound logistics. Do we send our own lorries out and bring in the goods? Or do we get the supplier to send us the goods? When the goods come, are we going to stick them in a warehouse? Or are we going to try and use them and put them immediately on the production line? Similarly, the outbound logistics. There's a choice there. Are we going to deliver goods ourselves? Are we going to get the logistics company to do it? Are we going to put goods in a warehouse and let customers come to us like a, a shop almost uh, and uh, buy the goods? So, so there's a, we're really talking here about, we will eventually be talking about kind of choice in, in how these are organized. And then of course, uh, getting back to this diagram, when we're selling, essentially what we're doing is we are liaising with the next people in the chain we'll be talking to really the procurement or purchasing department uh, in our customers. So here procurement is seen as a primary activity. It is central uh, to central part of the supply chain and, uh, and, and so on. This can get, uh, we need to get, get, a, get very complicated. Before that, we'll just look at a, 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 a couple of uh, phrases here. Uh, people talk about the uh, upstream and downstream parts of the supply chain. Uh, and what you have to think, uh, really, when uh, getting these sorted out, is, is think of a, a kind of river flowing through here, carrying products, okay, carrying raw material. And the river is going in this direction. And we are here, okay. Now, upstream from us is here. So think about a river. Upstream is where the water is coming from. And downstream is here, which is where the water is going to. And if you think of a, a barge or a boat on these carrying the goods along, then the upstream is where the raw material comes from. And the downstream is where the finished goods come from. So upstream and downstream, again, two elements you need to be just clear where they are here. So upstream, as it says here, is the supply chain before materials and goods reach us. The downstream uh, is the uh, supply chain for products after they leave us and on their way to the customers. And, and we have to get all of you know, both elements working into like clockwork. We have to have goods coming in from the upstream manufactured by us going to the downstream uh, and you have to kind of keep if you like a as best you can a continuous stream of goods going through uh, the whole value chain if there's a bit of a breakdown somewhere then then goods will begin to accumulate if the downstream breaks down if the upstream in some way has some problem to it 
Uh, you're not able to get raw materials coming in. You can't manufacture, you can't produce for your, uh, your uh, customers and, and, and so on. So what we need is a appropriate operation of the whole chain to improve efficiency, uh, deliver accurately and on time, uh, and not to incur more costs than are actually necessary. As uh, it says here, you will readily understand that IT uh, can play a huge uh, part in uh, really making the upstream, the manufacturing and the downstream uh, kind of work very, very efficiently indeed. Uh, the uh, company who, uh, certainly until recently, uh, was always uh, put forward as a fantastic uh, example of great operational efficiency. It's a computer company called Dell. And basically what Dell had, and we'll be talking about this in, in a moment, uh, is really they had a policy of kind of absolutely minimal inventory. They didn't like inventory. They said inventory is a waste of money, it takes up space, it gets damaged and so on. Uh, and the way they worked was that they would be getting orders coming in basically over the internet continually. Uh, and what they did was they consolidated orders uh, basically every half hour. So all their orders would be uh, consolidated. Now that means you'd add them together basically and you'd know how many you know, 500 megabyte hard disks you needed. You would know how many keyboards of a certain sort you need, how many monitors and the like. You know, from the orders, you could, you could work out all the components you would need to make the computers. And every half hour, they would, they would have this total and they would send it out to their suppliers. And the suppliers had one hour to deliver those parts. Now one hour, very, very short. Now essentially that means that you would have the, the Dell factory uh, and physically located very closely around it, you would have all your suppliers because you can't deliver, deliver stuff uh, within an hour if, if you're 100 miles away. Uh, so these, if you're going to be a Dell supplier, you had to locate more or less in the same place as the Dell factory. And then if we take this Dell factory, what would happen, a great big square factory here, all the way around it, you had really delivery bays and lorries from the manufacturers would uh, come up and basically they would uh, kind of back into a delivery bay and they would wait there. And goods were taken from them and put directly onto the production line. No goods, no raw materials went into inventory. Uh, and uh, they would wait until these goods were unloaded and used up essentially, then they'd kind of go away again. Uh, and it meant that really uh, the only inventory in the factory was <coughs> inventory work in progress, goods being made. Uh, and then at the end of the manufacturing, they would turn on the computers uh, let them run for an hour or two hours or something so they could be tested and, and so on. And then it'd be immediately dispatched to the customers. So the only inventory they had was work in progress and goods on test and goods actually uh, in the process of being delivered to customers. Now quite obviously to, to get that to work efficiently and reliable uh, requires huge coordination and the only way you could do that is by having a, an absolutely fantastic IT system uh, that could send orders out to your suppliers, receive the orders in, consolidate them, send them out, arrange for the dispatch of goods and so on, make sure that the, uh, the production line was set up so you knew exactly what sort of machine you was making at any particular time, all the right parts would be coming in for that particular machine and so on. And an awful lot of manufacturing, say in cars, takes place like that. You can specify your own car, the uh, sorts of upholstery, the color, uh, the, the uh, extras that you might want with the car, the size of the engine, the type of wheels and so on here. Uh, and, and basically you have all these different cars be made kind of one after the other uh, and everything just works like clockwork. 
And again, very sophisticated IT is needed to do the manufacturing planning. Now we talked about uh, Dell as, as uh, heating inventory uh, and the two uh, models really for supply chains and indeed inventory is a push model and a pull model. And if you're a manufacturer, really you've got two choices. You can start making goods and put them in the warehouse and hope people will buy them. And basically that's the push model. You build the forecast. You say we're in January now, last January, the, you know, we sold this amount of goods. We'll assume we'll kind of sell this amount of goods this January and so on. Uh, so what we look at here, we look at the historical demand patterns and we make hoping and assuming that these will kind of repeat themselves. A pull model doesn't do that. Uh, a pull model waits on an order coming in. So when it gets an order, this stimulates production and delivery. Essentially, this is just in time inventory. There are no finished, in the extreme model, there are no finished goods in inventory. There are not even any part finished goods halfway through the factory. When an order comes in, this triggers off a production process and the production process can in many cases trigger off a purchasing process from your suppliers. And this is very much what Dell was doing. Orders would come in, consolidate them, uh, send orders out to your suppliers, receive those goods, make the goods, dispatch them to the customers, all within a day. So there's practically no inventory. The danger, of course, uh, here is you are living on the edge a little bit. If any element of this, this uh, fantastic kind of clockwork machine breaks down, uh, you're going to be in some trouble. Uh, the potential advantage you had with the push model uh, here uh, is that you have got buffers. You've got a little bit of inventory sitting around. So if the supply uh, from your uh, suppliers is a little bit delayed, You've got, you've got some spare parts and inventory you can use as well. If a machine breaks down in production and your customer is, is desperate for products, well, you've got some products actually in inventory you can dispatch and try to catch up later. Uh, so it's maybe a little bit safer, but of course you have the, the inventory sitting there. And there's always the danger here uh, that you build the forecast, but the forecast is actually wrong. Uh, you're expecting great sales, but for some reason your product isn't popular. Maybe it's even a, you know, a change in the weather, a change in the seasons, uh, which means people don't want to buy that particular product. Supply chain networks uh, show the uh, uh, links between organizations and how informa in, uh, information and materials goes between these. Uh, and here we have a, 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 you know, a, a, a kind of an example here. So here we have our organization in uh, the middle and what we might do for some of our parts for example uh, we order from a supplier or the ultimate supplier uh, we order from our supplier the supplier goes maybe to the raw material manufacturer and then maybe this is delivered directly to us or the supplier might decide to go through a third party in that way. Uh, similarly uh, we have the ultimate customer who might be like you and me in the street. Uh, we go to a shop and we order goods. The shop then goes to the manufacturer who uh, is going to make those goods or dispatch those goods like that. The manufacturer could deliver directly or the manufacturer might go through the logistics company. These are just choices that we have. Uh, another way in which it might work uh, is we, we, in a way, uh, uh, almost like a virtual company uh, here, uh, that the organization in the middle here doesn't actually have to make anything. But maybe what it does, it organizes this supplier uh, and involves a third party logistics company here. So goods go directly like that without ever actually having to pass through the organization itself, without having to physically pass through the organization itself the organization uh, may be the one who's kind of pulling the strings and, and making sure everything actually ties up. As it says here, as with many other functions, outsourcing, good example, supply chain, supply chain management is logistics. 
Uh, it's often uh, used in operations management. Here's a more uh, complex example. This is a, uh, a potential example of a, an orange juice uh, supply uh, company. Uh, so here we have the, uh, the orange juice uh, marketer or supplier here. This isn't necessarily the company that makes the orange juice. Uh, this is a, a company which, if you like, organizes the manufacturer of orange juice. And what it does here, uh, it, it essentially organizes other people to produce the orange juice for it. So it uh, has to have the, the grower in the orchard for the oranges. Uh, there will be somewhere down here, someone who takes the oranges and squeezes the orange juice out of them. People put it in the bottle. Uh, there will be uh, the manufacturer of the plastic bottles, all the way back to the oil company, the plastic bottles, be a label producer and so on. So basically what comes from here are, are, are kind of bottles of orange juice. Uh, we don't know that other people make it, as far as we are aware, uh, these people are making it. We have no clue. Uh, you know, so, so when you go to a typical high street store and buy clothing, they don't make it usually. When you go to a supermarket uh, and buy almost anything, it's hardly ever the supermarket which makes the food, uh, even the food which is own label branded. So, you know, if you go to Asda or Sainsbury's and you buy Sainsbury's pizza, Sainsbury's is not making it. It's going to a, a third party uh, and the label which is put on is a Sainsbury's label. Uh, and then it's going to be distributed uh, here, usually using logistics uh, firms here. Some of the orange juice may go to airlines, some to restaurants, some to supermarkets, some to wholesalers and retailers and so on, and eventually to the consumer. So the whole pattern is really very, very complex. It's not just one pathway in, manufacture one pathway out. Uh, there are many people involved in the downstream and there are potentially many people involved in the upstream uh, to get the product to ultimate consumers in maybe a variety of different markets. Uh, and the whole process has become really quite sophisticated. Supply portfolios uh, here. Uh, this is uh, trying to make some decisions uh, about how we should get supplies, if you like, here. And basically, uh, not all supplies and raw materials are of equal importance, or if of equal seriousness, if you, if you like, uh, should we have some difficulty with those supplies. Uh, and here we have uh, this uh, portfolio approach here. It talks about the profit impact or the uh, annual expenditure relating to the supply, almost how material the supply is, how big the supply is, and we have the supply difficulty. Are there many suppliers who can easily, you know, send us goods, or are we maybe dealing with a more difficult, kind of monopolistic situation, where maybe there's only one supplier uh, with limited capacity and so on. And the portfolio is constructed like this. Uh, profit impact, relatively low, uh, not a very important uh, product, if you like, uh, or raw material, to a very important raw material, a very vital raw material, and then uh, low supply difficulty or high supply difficulty. So let's say uh, what, uh, what, what suggestions are made about what we should do in these various quadrants. And it starts off in here, the acquisition here, a non-critical quadrant, low profit impact, so it's not a very important item, if you like. Uh, we need it, but it's not dead and born, uh, and there's no supply difficulty. Uh, what I suggest here is maybe an example is just stationary. We do need office stationary, uh, but it's a kind of, you know, bit of a nuisance really in many ways. Uh, the world isn't going to fall apart if we have to switch to a different sort of uh, stationery. And by and large, there's not going to be any difficulty with the supply of paper and, and so on. Uh, what we have to be careful of doing is not spending 
too much of our time and effort and resources over the supply of something which is relatively unimportant and which is easy to get. So buyers might be tempted to spend a lot of time here simply because maybe it's easy. It's very non-challenging uh, here. Uh, you're not going to get much back from uh, spending a lot of time on this uh, here. What we should do is really try to buy this in a very simple, standardized way. Find a supplier, place a long-term order with that person, and just let them get on with it. Don't you know? spend any more time until a year's time when maybe the, the, uh, the, the, the contract is up for renewal and we have another go at it. The next one we have here, a critical or bottleneck quadrant. This is the one which is down here. So it's relatively low importance, low profit impact, uh, but of high difficulty. And what do they suggest uh, here? Uh, example, maybe unique components or components with erratic uh, supplies uh, here. So the supply difficulty is because it's unique, maybe only one supplier. Erratic supplies, maybe there are transport difficulties from wherever we're bringing it, maybe from abroad or something of that uh, sort. They don't have a high profit impact until they are not available uh, here. Uh, and one way that we maybe can protect ourselves against problems here, given that we're not very sure if we order goods today for next week, whether they're going to come in next week, but we're not spending a lot on them, is, well, why don't we order in bulk and order well in advance? So instead of ordering just a week at a time, why don't we place an order for a month? Uh, and then maybe two weeks into that month, we order for next month. So we always have, a, uh, if you like, some inventory in hand uh, because it's not that expensive, uh, but we do need it, but it's not that expensive. Uh, and if these supply difficulties uh, actually come to pass, then because we've got two weeks supply in hand, we can live on that uh, and hope that the, the product comes in again. Next one, leverage, high profit impact. These are, uh, you know, high cost, quite a, quite a high uh, turnover in these, these supplies, low market difficulties, so potentially lots and lots of suppliers here. So uh, packaging. So distinguishing packaging from stationery, uh, packaging can be very expensive if you have to package stuff in a protective uh, sort of a way. But generally speaking, uh, packaging is not particularly specialist. Uh, you can offend many, many people uh, who are potentially able to provide adequate packaging and, and so on. Uh, we need to spend some time in this because if there is a high profit impact, you know, knocking 10% off your packaging costs, uh, that 10% is a significant maybe saving and a significant increase to your profit. So it is well worth spending some time in getting a good deal there. And what we want to do is to make sure if we are awarding uh, you know, contracts to people, we want to take some care on that. Uh, this is going to be important that we give the contract to someone who saves us money. So one of the things we might be doing here is to tender to many suppliers, uh, play one off against the other, try to get the costs down and down and down and down, uh, because this is going to save us a lot of money. And then finally, we have what's called the strategic quadrant. It's an important uh, component and high cost, if you like, uh, that we have here. It's quite difficult to put our hands on here. It's a bit of an erratic supply, maybe, or very few suppliers here. Maybe specialist software. So there's maybe only one software company you think is uh, technically capable of delivering the software of the right sophistication, and it's going to be expensive. Uh, and what we want to do is to make sure we don't lose this special supplier, either because they go out of business or because maybe they're taken over by maybe a rival of ours. And once they're taken over by a rival of ours, then of course they won't be interested in supplying us anymore and so on there. So examples we have here is maybe we take them over 
or maybe what we do is we uh, want to enter into a, a long-term sort of relationship with this supplier, sign them up for maybe five years. Or maybe what we do, instead of taking them over, which brings the supply in-house, maybe we begin to uh, set up our own in-house supply, really to give us assurance of supply, to take that element of risk uh, out of our supply chain. Some of the main choices in the supply chain here, who transports the goods? Is it us? Is it logistics? Uh, is it the customer or the, uh, the um, uh, supplier? We've got, got all those choices. Uh, what delivery pathways are uh, best? Uh, and by delivery pathways, it can be geographical delivery pathways, but also can we, should we do it by road? Should we do, do it by rail? Should we do it by air and uh, so on? There can be different costs, but different times involved in this uh, as well. Who stores the goods? Do we store the raw materials or do we get the logistics company to store the raw materials? Because many logistics companies will, will do that. Uh, who in a way looks after the goods? Because again, some goods you have to keep below a certain temperature, food and pharmaceuticals. How are we going to ensure that the goods are kept in good condition? Is that something we're going to pass on to the logistics company and actually ask them to prove that the temperature of these goods has not risen above five degrees centigrade and, and, and the like? Uh, who's going to carry out the labelling, what's called kitting? Kitting, uh, for example, is uh, uh, like putting batteries in mobile phones, making sure they're initially half charged and so on there. Is it going to be us? Is it going to be the supplier? Is it going to be the logistics company? Certainly in the UK, when many phones come into the UK, let's say from Samsung, it is a logistics company which does the basically the kitting uh, to make sure all the bits are in the right boxes and so on, uh, to make sure that uh, any adjustments that are needed are made to the phones so that they work on the, the, the wave bands uh, which are in the, the UK. Other responsibilities that we have to decide on uh, quality assurance, like keeping goods at a certain temperature and so on. Uh, how are we going to handle goods which are returned from our customers, maybe because there's a fault? Who's going to collect them? Uh, if you have ordered goods online, uh, say from Amazon, uh, you know they've got quite an efficient way of doing it. You can print off a label, uh, you attach that label to a package, you can take it somewhere to be collected and so on. But they've thought very carefully about how people who receive goods which they don't want or don't work or faulty something are going to return those efficiently to Amazon. How Amazon is going to know who they're from when they receive them and so on uh, because people are notorious at maybe sending back goods without the right information that allows you to be credited. Uh, how can we do things quickly enough uh, to, to, to please customers and to effectively compete uh, with other suppliers in the market. And if you're dealing with an international environment, who handles customs clearance? Uh, who maybe pays any customs duty which is, which is required? And finally, uh, we look at uh, uh, sustainability uh, and operations management. Uh, business sustainability, also known as corporate sustainability, is the management and the coordination of three elements. There is uh, environmental or ecological sustainability, there is social sustainability, and there is financial sustainability. And these three elements, environmental, social, and financial, uh, is sometimes known as a triple bottle bottom line. Now, I suppose until maybe 10, 20 years ago, that, that idea was not one which was recognised. The bottom line always meant your profit, the financial sustainability, that organisations were regarded as being sustainable, uh, provided they made good profits every year. Now the uh, stakeholders uh, involved, and indeed some increasingly legal aspects which are involved, regulations and so on, 
mean that being financially sustainable isn't maybe quite enough. Uh, people are looking for you to be environmentally sustainable and also socially sustainable. The other types of sustainability which uh, we have, other than financial sustainability, maybe requires uh, a longer horizon, if you like, to look at. So it's a bit like I could build a factory and I could put no thermal insulation in it at all. That's probably the cheapest way of building the factory, very thin walls, flimsy walls and so on. Uh, uh, and then I can, I can simply bear the cost of heating it. Now that in a way spreads a lot of the cost into the future. Or what I could do is spend a lot more money building a factory which was well insulated. Uh, uh, so there's a, there's a hit now, if you like, a financial hit now that it costs more. But I'm going to save money in the future, uh, financially, uh, because my heating costs are going to be lower. And we have this bit of a, a playoff that an awful lot of the financial considerations are short term. We, 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 we produce financial statements in periods of a year. Uh, and we see you know, very sensitive to profits going up and down in a year. And it can be quite difficult to maybe convince stakeholders that it might be worthwhile spending a bit more now to save money in the future, but not only save money in the future, uh, maybe to be seen as being environmentally acceptable and indeed socially acceptable. So uh, many of the large uh, IT organizations now uh, are building uh, their large server farms where they have these huge, basically, disk units, thousands of disk units, uh, recording all the sorts of information that come in big data and uh, Facebook and Google and so on and there. Many of them are choosing to build these server farms, as they're called, in cold areas, up mountains, relatively north in Norway and Alaska and so on, uh, because there, if you build them there, you've got no cooling problems. It's, it's cold outside uh, and natural cooling will, is going to save you money. And they're doing this for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, they probably have evaluated the long-term financial benefit of doing that. Uh, but also they have a, a wary eye, I think, on public relations and being able to almost corporate social responsibility and be able to almost to boast to stakeholders that we are ecologically uh, respectful uh, and that we understand what you as consumers would prefer as our method of uh, cooling and the use of resources. So as it says here, if you are seen to be a good company, ethically sound and so on, uh, this is good for PR, good for your brand, good for recruitment, uh, good for collaboration with other companies. So here's our some examples of how we could improve the triple bottom line, if you like, the sustainability. We can choose where to put our suppliers, our production facilities, uh, how we're going to serve our customers well. Uh, it may be more efficient to locate, you know, to, to, to make sure you, you access raw materials locally. Uh, you have some people talking about the number of miles food in supermarkets travels before it gets to the supermarket. And basically, they would say, if I try to buy locally as far as I can, then I'm keeping down the carbon footprint of getting the food into the supermarket. We can improve efficiency. Uh, we see it almost you know, in running machinery. Uh, improve the, uh, the, the, the amount of work you get out per kilowatt hour of electric going in. Uh, switch maybe to uh, uh, electrical use of energy on your uh, delivery vehicles, maybe rather than petrol or have some sort of hybrid vehicle and so on. Uh, social sustainability managed staff. Uh, in many countries, it has become quite difficult to get staff of adequate quality. Many jobs have become much more demanding, much more technical, uh, and there's greater competition for 
uh, staff with the right technical skills, particularly as the birth rate in some countries has fallen. There are fewer new young people coming onto the market to go into these more technically challenging jobs. So you want to manage them uh, to make the best use of their expertise and skills and their training. Uh, make sure that you uh, uh, maintain products or uh, maintain machinery. Uh, again, we you know we, we can slip into this almost on a on a, on a kind of personal basis. Uh, we have a car. We know the car should have an annual service because the annual service will make it run more efficiently. Uh, but sometimes we we are tempted to skimp on that annual service to miss it out. Uh, again, it saves us money in the short term. Uh, but longer term, the machine is going to be less efficient. And of course, longer term, you are running the risk of having a great big breakdown, which is going to be very expensive indeed. And then environmental sustainability. Uh, at least measure, if you can, the pollution which is being released. Uh, be alert, be alive to what's going on there. Uh, try to recycle, try to reduce carbon footprints. Apart from anything else, it's likely actually to save you money. Apart from all the, the moral issues that may be involved in it, uh, the, being a good environmentally sustainable company is probably going to save you money in the, no worse than the medium term.